Okay, welcome to Fivefold Ministry Activation. So, so far we have learned about the office of the apostle, which is represented by the thumb, brings strength, puts the team together. It's all about making sure that a church is founded and centered upon Jesus Christ and remains that way. Last week, Les Thomason brought the prophet, the pointing finger, really helps bring identity to individuals and helps us know as a church where we're going as a region, as a nation, and beyond. And we got a lot of great um, prophetic protocol, how prophetic should be seen going forth. And I, I learned a lot last week. It was excellent. Good. Remember, we are um, the fivefold gifts are for the office of these different roles. They all come from Christ. Their purpose is to... Re- is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So when you have an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher pouring into your lives, you should expect to grow up in full maturity and in proper balance so you can really do ministry well. A lot of people are in extremes because they only receive from very few of those giftings. But my heart and my prayer, I believe this house is called to be a five-fold house where the people that come to this house will be raised up in all the giftings so that you can serve on your job and in your home and in your neighborhood well because you're apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastoral, and you can teach all those things together as needed. So um, tonight is the middle finger, (laughs) which extends the furthest, as we know, which is all about outreach, all about winning souls. And this, as we've learned, is not just for the gift of evangelists to do. It's the whole church, every believer, is called to do the work of an evangelist. The evangelist equips the church to do evangelism. So we have tonight a special guest. Hopefully more of the students will get here because the word evangelist scares everybody. And our evangelist tonight is scary, right? No. <laughs> Most of you don't know... Craig, he's going to explain more of his ministry. I know he's been in ministry for 35 years. Did I get it right? Whatever, yeah. Something like that. He's from Long Beach Island. He's not that far away. Good friends with uh, Walt Healy. Knows him real well. He's very close to John Kelly. Apostle John Kelly is going to be here in May. They know each other from childhood all the way through. So He's going to explain all about his ministry and all about the ministry of evangelists and evangelism. So just welcome Craig Fazler. 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 What time do I go to? We go to 7.20, take a break. Go get a little snack. Okay. Start again at 7.30. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Craig. Who am I? Fazler. Fazler. That's the Greek, one's the Hebrew, you know. Um, so I just keep the mic, uh, maybe it's not even one, maybe it's here, whatever. I yeah, I don't even need it, sure, sure. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on intro. I got saved in 1981. Uh, my wife was getting ready to leave me. She'd had enough, and uh, I wasn't a very nice guy. And I called up John Kelly, who I knew since I was uh, age 11. So out of all the the big guns that Kelly rolls with, uh, the one uh, accolade that I have is I'd known him longer than anybody. So I knew John when he was about 18. He was a big stomping guy, and I was a little kid delivering papers at night. But uh, John and I, our paths kept uh, crossing. And to make a long story short, Kelly led me to Christ. Jesus started to appear to me in dreams and visions. Uh, I've heard his audible voice in our bedroom, and uh, things started to change. And my wife and I are, in a few months, getting ready to celebrate our 43rd wedding anniversary. And, uh, you know, you can read between the lines. I still chase her around the house. And if somebody, if we're together, she doesn't like this very much, but if they say, do you have any children? And I always say three so far. 
you know, my wife looks at me like, you know, when's this guy going to get a grip on things? But uh, anyway, so I got saved, and the whole gospel message, uh, I was overwhelmed with the fact that I had truth. And that just blew me away. And I would say to my pastor, Ed Mannering, I don't know if you know Ed, uh, John once said he wishes he had a hundred Ed Mannerings. But I would say to my pastor uh, multiple times a week, Ed, you know, this is really serious business we have here, the gospel. And he would say, I know Craig, I know Craig, I know Craig. And by the grace of God, I still feel like that today. As we get started tonight, could I just have one volunteer, not everybody, okay, please, but if I could just have one volunteer stand up and boldly proclaim the Great Commission. Not everybody, not everybody, please, just one person, not everyone, uh, with anyone. Um, you know, if we don't do it here, we'll never do it out there. We are family here. Come on. Somebody stand up. David Beer. Was here, you know. He would be doing that. Come on. Who? One of our students. Oh, okay. Come on. Now, I, I have to have somebody stand up and boldly proclaim the gospel. Well, so, okay, here we go. Go into all the world. Uh, yeah, well, it's basically it. So let's give him a round of applause, huh? Didn't he do a great job? So Jesus said, go ye into all the world. And the church in America, I don't know if we think Jesus was talking to a Chinese evangelist, go ye, you know? But uh, maybe that's why Paul Young Yi Cho went, and he's got a church of over a million. Of course, his name now is David Cho. Uh how many people here tonight believe they have truth? Anybody? Eternal truth? Raise your hand, please, if you do. How is it we believe we have truth, but 95% of all Christians have never shared their faith? And I've prayed to the Lord about this for years. I just don't get it. One of my mentors, Mark Estes, out on the West Coast, uh, he's senior pastor now, City Bible. He was getting his hair cut one day, and she said, what do you do for all of me? He says, well, I'm an equipping evangelist with Christian Equippers International. That's who I've been with for 25 years. We're based out in Lake Tahoe, California, but I live here in the Bible Belt in New Jersey. And uh, so anyway, Mark said to her, well, I'm an equipping evangelist. And she laughed, and she said, well, everybody in our church is an evangelist. And Mark said, what do you, he says, what do you mean? How often do you get trained? She says, we get trained every Thursday night. He said, how big is your church? She says, we have about 240 people in our church. He says, how many come out on Thursday night? She said, about 240. How come... They're more convinced and more passionate about their lies than Christians are about their faith. Why do we always look for someone else to sit, tell somebody else about Jesus? It's a real problem. It really is. And you know what? There are two groups of people in every church. And you will belong to one group. I will belong to one group. The two groups are, are this. I don't care if your congregation has five people in it or it's got 10,000 people in it. There are two groups. The remnant who God will always use and the rest who are at rest. Okay? And this is our life. It's not dress rehearsal. Our life, what we're doing, we are building our legacy of how we'll be remembered. I want you to know that. and I don't want to get into all that because I'm kind of getting off subject matter here. But I believe there's a problem in America. And I believe the problem is that we've missed the heart of God. And that's passion for lost people. When was the last time you shared your faith? When was the last time you were awakened in the middle of the night and you started to weep uncontrollably for your lost next door neighbor? 
If you haven't encountered these things, then perhaps you're lacking passion for lost people. But because Jesus lives in us, his passion is within us. But this passion that I'm talking about, I cannot, I cannot give it to you through my words. It can only come through the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to sound hyper-spiritual or anything else, but I'm telling you, it's a God thing only. You can't get a cassette a DVD, whatever, and, and chew it up and get passion. This has to come from God. The light bulb comes on only through God. So we want to talk tonight how to have passion for lost people. Over the last 25 years with Christian equippers, I've traveled extensively North America and many parts of the world. And pastors will call me up, say, Pastor from Nebraska, will say, Craig, will you show my people how to share their faith? I say, Pastor, I'll show them playing A, B, C, and D. But if there is no passion for lost people, it'll fall on deaf ears and it's not going to happen. <laughs> Where a man or woman finds their passion, that's where they find their energy. Okay? All right? Now, Pastor, please forgive me. I've never met your wife. What is her name? Lorraine. Lorraine? Okay. So let's say that Pastor Josh... Now, I know a little bit how he met her, but we're going to kind of rework that a little bit. Is that okay? So let's say they're in high school. Okay? And Josh sees Lorraine get out of this uh, hyper vet. And she pulls into the parking lot. And like immediately he is like just, boom, his heart is pounding. And what he does, he lays in bed at night thinking of ways how he can run into her. Maybe where her locker is in her hall. Where she has lunch. Where she has algebra class. And because he has a passion for her okay he pursues that passion and it's the same thing in evangelism if you would please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 we're going to go pretty fast here because uh, got a lot to cover Okay, so I'm just going to keep going here. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, right now, there, are a, there is a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. All the great heroes of the faith who have gone on before us. Billy Graham is now one of them. Joshua, Paul, Billy Graham maybe Brother Jake up the street, whomever. And they're encouraging us to go for it. That this is our time. This is our time. If the devil can't stop you from getting saved, he'll, he'll do everything he can to keep you in the pew. You know why they call it pews? Because they stink. And we need to get out of them. Okay? Remember, in church on Sunday morning, tens of... Of, of millions of people in America go to, go to church and they tell God how much they love Him. And that's a wonderful thing. But then we go outside and we become secret service agents for God, never allowing our true identity to be known. Where is the breakdown? What happens? Are we ashamed of the one who has bled and died for us? We have to fight that thing. My number one conversation with myself in the mirror is simply three words. Shut up, Craig. I don't like your attitude. I don't want to hear it. My flesh is opposed to what God wants me to do. My flesh will lead me to death all day long. Okay? We're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us also lay aside every incomperance and the sin which so easily entangles us. The writer here is saying that sin easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that was set before us. 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Did you ever read that and think, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy? I'm sure we've all seen the passion of the Christ. As much as I love to watch good movies over and over again, I only could watch that movie one time. I was physically, emotionally exhausted. I had no tears left. And yet Paul says, who for the joy that was set before him, do you know what that joy was? That one day he would see our face in heaven. That's that joy. And may we have that same joy that we will look to see others in heaven. I say to the church, I say, what are we going to do when we find out that Jesus was actually telling the truth? And they look at me like, oh, what's he talking about? Of course Jesus is telling the truth. But we don't live like he's telling the truth. I look at the church in America today when I travel, and they look at me like they just had a lobotomy. There's nothing there. It's a blank stare. It's the only thing that the, the world and the church both hate, evangelism. There's not a plan B. Jesus said, go. Go means go, ye means you. Go ye means go you. Right? That's what it means. So, but the Lord also says, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. It shouldn't be one of these things where the Holy Spirit's got an arm behind our back and i got to go out and evangelize. Okay? We're going to change that with this passion that we're talking about. I want to tell you about a person real quick that had passion. Who illustrates passion. His name is Bill McKean. He's a marathon runner out in Lake Tahoe. My mentor Mark Estes knew him. Bill's running along the side of the road. He literally got ran over from the back. A Mazda Miata ran over his entire body from the back. And the car ran over his whole body. They did not expect him to live. He had crushed lungs, ribs, broken legs. His hip was shattered in six places. His right leg was, was broken in eight places. They never thought he would ever walk. And after two years of squeezing a tennis ball and extreme physical therapy, he was finally able to, to walk. And somebody from the Sierra, Sierra Nevada Club came into him and they said, Bill, Bill, we want to give you an invitation. That if you're ever able to, you have an open invitation to run in the 100 mile Sierra Nevada run. I don't even like driving my car 100 miles. So Bill got the invitation and he had the nurse tack it on the wall. And Bill kept looking at that. And after two more years, he was able to get along fairly well. And he said to his wife, he said, I'm going into the Sierra Nevada run. She goes, Bill, you can barely walk. What are you talking about? He goes, no, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. She says, Bill, you're almost dead four years ago. It took you two years to learn how to walk. He said, I'm doing it. So sure enough, the Sierra Nevada run is not like running around a track 400 times. It's through the, the creek beds of the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's through the desert, scorpions, snakes, everything else in the middle of the summer. And Mark told me the story that they're out there. ABC World, a wide world of sports is there. And we got Bill McKean here. Bill, four years ago, almost died as a car literally ran over him. Bill, tell us about your testimony. So they start down the testimony, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now it's time for the race. So the runners are all on their line, and boom! And there's the gun, and they start taking off. And, and Bill's got this eight, he can barely, barely run. So he's out of sight. 
The first checkpoint is 25 miles. No Bill McKean. Everybody else has hit the 25 mile point. He comes in. He had fallen. He had twisted his ankle of that leg that he had eight breaks in. And they said, Bill, listen, good try, uh, but you know what? You know, maybe in the future. And Bill's like, what are you talking about? I'm not stopping this race. And so he gets in and again he goes. And now the gap between everybody else and Bill is extended. He gets to the 50 mile point. He stumbles in. He dislocates his hip. He's laying there in excruciating pain. And, and they have medical care all along this whole 100 mile route. And they're saying, get that ambulance over here. We got to get McKean to the hospital. He says, I'm not going anywhere. He says, get a couple of nurses. Get my hip back in. So they lay him down on the ground. And, like, and they get him back in. They duct tape his hip. The first night, everybody's still out there. The second day... People, dribs and drabs are coming in. Everybody's in except Bill McKean. Everybody. There's no sight of him. His wife and kids are there. They got a trailer. ABC uh, Wide World Sports is there. They got these big halogen lights set up. And, and everybody's just looking. There's no sign of Bill McKean all through the night. He's now out in the desert for two nights straight. The next morning, Mark is literally watching the TV. Uh, and the announcers are like, um, hey, this is uh, Hank Williams from ABC Sports. And uh, Bill McKean now has been out on the road for two days. You know his story. He almost died four years ago, blah, blah, blah. And he's talking to us. Well, wait, wait a minute. Officer. Hold it. we got a break here. And they look. And Bill McKean is off in the horizon. And he's barely standing. Barely standing. He's going down on his hands and then getting up and continuing, falling back down on his hands. Mark said, everybody there was crying. Mark said he's sitting in front of his TV just crying his eyes out. And finally, after a number of hours, Bill McKean came in. Mark says, two weeks later, he's at the grocery store. And who's he running to? Bill McKean. He said, Bill, I saw you two weeks ago, man. He said, that was unbelievable. He said, tell me about the pain. He said, Mark, I felt no pain. The only thing I knew was that I needed to complete the race. That's the only thing I knew. And that's passion. That there's a course, there's a race that's been set for, for us to run. And if we look at Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Just turn it real quickly with me, if you would. This is a King James Version. It says, To whom he also showed himself alive after his passion. Now, when I think of passion, I usually think of something very beautiful, like a passionate kiss, maybe when I cut back on a trip. But when you look up Webster for passion, it's the suffering of Jesus. It says that Jesus was a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. I don't believe that he just suffered physically, but he suffered for the souls. He suffered for Israel. He suffered in his spirit. And to have passion for lost people, it's a painful place. And I'm going to show you how you can get there. Do we realize how much Jesus despised going to the cross? I'm not even going to turn there, but in Luke 22, 42, he said, Father, if this cup can pass for me. Jesus did not want to go through with this, guys. He was looking for plan B. But even before the Father could answer him, he's like, no, 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 no. Not my will, but thy will be done. And I talk to so many Christians that tell me they don't feel led to evangelize. 
Oh, the only lead they have is the lead that's in their, in their pants that holds them down in their chair. Okay? It has nothing to do with being lead or, or feeling lead or not feeling lead. Jesus did not feel lead. He was obedient son to his father. The other night I'm in prayer and I said, Lord, I just want to be your servant. You know, years ago there used to be bond servants in the Old Testament and they would take the awl and put it through the ear, okay? Because the servant could have left, but he said, no, master, I want to stay here forever. And that's what we want to get to in our life. I can tell you by the grace of God, I am as passionate for lost people today than I was back in 1981 when I got saved. I'm more in love with Jesus every day of my life. Every morning, now here's some keys. Every morning, I rededicate my life to Christ. Every morning. <clears throat> Paul said, I forget not whence from where I've come. I remember what I was back prior to 1981. And Jesus rescued me. He restored me. I owe him everything. If he never does another thing for me, he's done too much already. The only words that should ever come out of my mouth are, Thank you, Lord. I'm indebted to him forever. John Kelly, who led me to Christ. How do you repay someone? How do you show them the appreciation? That they gave you the words to eternal life. They gave you the words that would get you out of the muck and the mire. So your family, your kids would not be statistics like so many. How do you thank somebody like that? How do you do that? And those people were out there. We all have lost friends, relatives, neighbors, and co-workers. One of my favorite scriptures that I do want to turn to real briefly is in Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, 7. 700 years before Christ, Isaiah is writing this. He says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. When I think about that, Jesus was slaughtered for me. And he says, Craig, I just want you to go and tell people about me. And I said, well, you know, Lord, you know, it's not really my gifting. Well, first of all, there's nowhere in the Bible that says evangelism is a gifting. It's a responsibility. There's the office of the evangelist for the equipping of the body. But we're all called to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And I'll tell you what, if you find yourself in that situation, you feel a little dorky, you know what? You just get by yourself and say, you know what, Craig? Shut up. I don't want to hear it. Get the Jersey attitude. Get your lip up. Little Rocky Balboa action. Really? We're led by the Spirit, not by the flesh. But I think about that. When I was in college, I lived with a few guys. We had our apartment. And a couple of the guys were bouncers in bars. <clears throat> I was the little guy of the group. One of the guys started varsity fullback as a freshman. These guys just, you know, flossed with six penny nails. I mean, these guys were, you know, I don't know how I got the, you know, it was actually the worst thing that ever happened to me being with those guys. But, you know, I used to... I used to go in these bars and drink for free and I didn't have to pay anything. I had protection. It was kind of like the Gambino family. And I saw a lot of men beaten up. But I always recognized them. But Isaiah said that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as his sheep before his shears, so he did not open his mouth. He was oppressed and afflicted. Uh, I think I'm thinking in 52, where it says we could not have recognized him. Isaiah says that in 52. I don't have the verse right in front of me. I'm not going to look it up for the sake of time. But he, we could not have recognized him. That Jesus looked like a piece of raw meat hanging on the cross. And he just says, 
Just tell your lost friends and relatives and neighbors and co-workers about me. Yet 95% say no. They don't say no, they just don't do it. It's like when my son was small, I'd say, Brian, by the time I get home, make sure the lawn's mowed. Okay, Dad. So we tell him, but then I get home, the lawn's not mowed. So it's the same thing. You know what I'm saying? So how do we get past all these things? They say the first three years of a Christian's walk. Now I'm laying a foundation of what Jesus did. Now this is the meat and potatoes, how you can get passion for lost people. Okay? They say the first three years of a Christian's walk is the most productive. Then we become part of the frozen chosen. How do we counter that? By the grace of God, and I'm telling you, with my nose shoved on the floor, all glory to Jesus, I've been able to buck the odds and stay just as smoking hot for God as the day I got saved. And I'm just going to tell you how I've done it for me. I'm not saying it's the way or anything else. I'm just telling you what I've done. And it's worked. Okay? Now. <clears throat> first of all, I I'm convinced I have truth. And if you're not convinced you have truth here tonight, you have to get that settled. I'm not a real smart guy. I'm just a meat and potatoes guy. Okay? Josh McDowell wrote a book, More Than a Carpenter. I suggest you get that book. I've had tons of manifestations from age nine. I've had demons manifest where they were under my bed, pounding up where my body was flying through the air. I've seen demons manifest in churches and public schools. I, you know, I could tell you tons of demon stories. And I know they're real. And every time in the name of Jesus, I've seen victory. Amen. I had an assistant pastor in Oklahoma one night. Full-blown demonic manifestation when I touched his chest. I know that I have truth. Josh McDowell, more than a carpenter. Chapter 3, Lord, liar, lunatic. He puts Jesus on trial. The reader in the place of a jury says he can only be one of three. We can't very well say he was a prophet because he never claimed that, although he may have had the attributes of a prophet, a religious leader, a moral person, a teacher, etc., etc., etc. But we can't patronize it and say he was a prophet. Jesus claimed to be the Savior of the world and made no bones about it. So Josh says he can only be one of three. He's either Lord who he claims he is, or he's a liar. But if Jesus is a liar, we can't very well say he was a good person if he was outrightly deceiving you and I for our eternal destiny, or he was a lunatic that would put him on the level of a poached egg. So Josh looks at all three eloquently. And by far, the greatest probability is that he is who he claims he is. Was he a liar? We don't see any course of this throughout his life. We only see men of hatred turning into men of love, channels of love. We've seen bad go to good. Was he a lunatic? And yet, on a very... As he's hanging on the cross with the sin of the world on his shoulders. He has total sanity of mind. To the point he's even concerned about others. He says, woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. He doesn't look down on mankind, but he looks up to heaven. He says, father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. If it was a lunatic, if it was a hoax, 
I'm sure he would have gave into it. And yet we see one thing after another, miracles and, and everything else. So I am convinced by Lord Liar Lunatic and what I've experienced in my life that he's not a liar, he's not a lunatic. There's one other choice. And that does not mean I understand it all. I don't. Uh, but I don't understand my remote control TV. <laughs> I just know that he is. So don't get crossed up with about a lot of rabbit trails where the enemy would take you. I don't need to know if the, if the earth is a million years old or 10,000, if Fred Flintstone ever walked the earth. It doesn't matter. All I know is he is. And that's all I need to know. And through that chapter 3, even more than all the manifestations I've had in my life, I would allow ISIS to cut my head off over chapter 3. It's not a liar. It's not a lunatic. It's just one, there's only one choice. Okay? Now, I prayed some prayers. This is the meat of how... More meat of how I keep passion for lost people. First is, I'm convinced I have truth. you got to get that set. You need to buy more than a carpenter. Okay? Five ninety nine a couple. If you need to remortgage the house, whatever you need to do, have Pastor Josh take a special love offering or something. The other thing is, I have some prayers that I do, and I've been praying this one prayer for thirty five years. Remember, I'm not a smart guy. I'm a meat and potatoes guy, but and this is simply my prayer. If you don't have a doctorate degree, you probably won't get it. Okay, but write it down and uh, maybe you can, you know, talk to some guy that's got a doctorate in theology. This is my prayer for 35 years. Lord, I pray that I'm so googly-eyed in love with you that everything else pales in comparison. That's it. Because when I love him the way he deserves to be loved, I'm who I'm called to be. I'm the husband I'm called to be. I'm the father. I'm the friend. The brother. And I'm willing to give my life for anybody in here. When I love him the way I'm called to love. Paul said in Romans 7, no good thing lives in me. So my flesh doesn't correct my flesh. I go to my source. And I say, Father, may I be just so googly-eyed in love with you that everything else pales in comparison. I mean, do you really think he's going to say, wow, what a selfish prayer. I'm never going to answer that. No way. Man, he is all over that. He's like, wow, look at my boy. Look at my boy. He just wants to bless me. And I'm like, oh, man, just going to fill him with love for me. Another prayer. Lord, let me feel, and I hammer on the floor, and I pound heaven's gates for this, because I need this, because my flesh stinketh, with or without right guard. That's King James. This is my prayer. Lord, let me feel what you feel for lost people. And here it is. To the point that I am provoked to action. Break my heart, God. Till I am provoked to action. Then I have a kamikaze prayer. Kamikaze pilots were Japanese pilots that basically gave their lives during World War II. And they would fly into our naval ships. Well, I have a kamikaze prayer. And I say, Lord, I want you to have your perfect will done in my life. Or it could be lost souls. And Lord, when you start to adjust me and change me, 
and I start to kick and howl and scream, don't listen to me. Ignore me. See, with me, it's constantly going to my Father in Heaven to change me. He's the only father I've ever known in my entire life. I never knew my real dad. He's the only dad I've known. Sometimes he'll wake me up in the middle of the night and I sense that he wants me to hang out with him. Now, some people, you know, if you cannot tarry an hour, blah, 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 you know, and they, you know, and they go in and make sure they sew their eyelids open for an hour and they got the list and all that. It's, it's not the way I roll. I'm not saying that's wrong. But you got to understand, coming from a kid that never had a dad, I can't have my heavenly dad's relationship be like that. It's just got to be based on the fact that we're tight. So one, one morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I got up. I, I just felt the Lord want to talk to me. So I get up and go into my office and I sit on the edge of this love seat and my desk is here, love seat's here and I just said, well Lord, you know what's up? I felt like you wanted to talk about something. He says, son, get up. I get up, have my Spider-Man, no I didn't, I'm just teasing. <laughs> If I stood up, he says, son, put, lay your hands on yourself. And I got scared because we've been this route before. And I've, you know, we've gone places I really haven't wanted to go. He said, I want you to pray this prayer. So I laid hands on myself and I prayed this prayer. So just for a minute, we're going to just shut our eyes, and I want you to lay hands on yourself, okay? And just be with me here a minute. So you got to imagine, 3 o'clock in the morning, dark room, and I'm just waiting here for he says. Okay? So I'm there, and I'm saying, Father, Father, your word says that I can do nothing on my own, and I can only say yay and amen to that. That, Lord, without you, I am a slave to sin. And yet, Lord, you've come to set captives free. And through you, Lord, I can do all things. And, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, I pray, God, for the light of Christ to come in and invade every cell within my being. Father, you, you would drive out every bit of darkness every bit of sin that I would burn a blaze for you. And Lord, if I say I will not mention you, God, may it be like fire shut up within my bones, God, that I cannot contain. Lord, that I would be as Paul. He says, woe to me if I would preach the gospel, for I am compelled to preach the gospel. Lord, set me a blaze for you, Lord God. And Lord, don't give me any choice in this. Just set me a place for you. Lord, that I would be your trophy and bring you glory, Lord. And I'm standing there and tears are just running down my face. And again, do you really think God's saying, man, what a selfish prayer. I'm never going to answer that. It's like, wow, look at my boy. But they are the words God gave me. See, I can only do this through Him. And you can have passion when you go to your source. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.16 that if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about because I'm compelled to do it. And see, that's what's missing in Christians today. There's no passion. There's no drive. Nobody cares about other people. It's like, I'm going to heaven and the rest of my community can go to hell. Yeah. So, because my flesh is still here, I go to my source and I ask him to change me with those prayers and he does. In 
in John, or rather in Ephesians um, chapter 4, verse 1, let's just wrap up here. Actually, forgive me. Before we go there, I want to share with you a story, and then we're going to close. Um, so we're going to be close to 22 after. I want to wrap up with a story of a great hero of the faith by the name of Alexander Duff. Anybody ever hear of Alexander Duff? He was a great missionary to India, and he was from England. And he went over there as a very young man. And he came back on a furlough. But it really wasn't a furlough. He was coming home to England to die. His one suit that he owned that he used to be able to fill out because of the muscles and all. Now it just hung on him. He was more skeletal than anything. And there at the Church of England, before the General Council of Assemblies of the churches there in England, he was asked to speak. And as he was introduced, everyone stood in honor of Alexander Duff. And Alexander Duff spoke, and he's in his upper 80s, and he can barely speak, and, and he makes a plea. For young people to give their lives for the souls of people in India. Now compared to him, we're all young, even me. And he said, no one responded. And he waited a couple more minutes. And he made another strong plea. And again, no one responded. And he gave one more plea. And under the strain of the appeal, that's passion for lost soldiers, lost souls, he collapsed and fainted on the stage. He woke up. The doctor was there. The general counsel assemblyman was there. And Dr. Duff just laid there looking up and he said, where am I now? Where am I now? And the doctor said, Alexander, your heart is too weak. Just lie there still. But the white-haired warrior said, but I haven't finished my appeal. I have not yet finished my appeal. Take me back. Take me back. And he wouldn't be stopped. So with the doctor on one side and the general assemblyman on the other, they helped the white-haired warrior back into the pulpit. Close to 90 years old. Frail is anything. And he. And he was quiet. And he gave one more appeal. No one responded. And he made a very. Very hard. Decision. And he said, old and decrepit that I am, I will go back to India. And even though I cannot preach, I can lie on the shores of the Ganges River and die to let the people of India know that at least one Christian cares about their souls. And at that point, Duff was done. He just turned and he started to walk off. And as he did, all of a sudden the voice goes, Dr. Duff, I'll go! And another voice, and another voice, and another voice. And scores of people did go. And they followed the lead and the passion of that great white-haired warrior, Alexander Duff. And I just want to close with this last scripture here. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians.
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul. Therefore I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, or the Lord Jesus, I implore you to live a life or walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And I, and I believe that's a good word for us. To live a life worthy of the calling that we have. Live a life worthy of the calling. Whatever we need, it's His good pleasure to give us the kingdom. We need passion for lost people. We go to Him. We pray these prayers. He will honor them. I am living proof of them. Get convinced that you have truth. What's it say in Daniel? Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars above. I think that's Daniel 12 verse 9. So, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just uh, commit this first session to you. Father, I pray, Lord, that the word spoken has taken root. Lord, I pray, God, that each person here that your heart was the good soil, Lord, and it would bear much fruit for thy glory. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Lord. Father, give us this passion for lost people, God. Let us feel what you feel, Lord, to the point that you break our hearts and we are provoked to do something, God. Thank you, Lord. Be a thorn God, be a thorn in our flesh. Be a thorn, God, for the rest of our lives, Lord, that we never escape the passion, the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that we would love you the way that you deserve to be loved. That everyone in here, including myself, Lord, that we'd be so just googly-eyed in love with you, Papa that everything else would pale in comparison. Thank you, Lord. You are our source. You are the potter. We're nothing but globs of clay. So, Lord, mold us and shape us, God, into the heroes of the faith that you've called us to be for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, Lord, totally consume us with the light of Christ that we would burn a blaze for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Good. What we're going to do, we're going to take a look at a scripture. We're all familiar with the woman at the well. Okay, and Jesus comes to her. Um, unfortunately... We can't get this on a bigger screen here tonight. But I said to Pastor Josh, this was actually bigger than the TV I grew up with. Of course, the cabinet was this big, but the picture was only that big, you know, with the rabbit ears. So, um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. So we're probably going to uh, need to adjust this volume. The audio is more important than the visual on this. So do we need someone up there? Or? Oh, we'll turn out. Turn out. Sorry. Okay, and you know what I can do? I can move it away if it's too close, if it's too bad or something. Okay, you guys ready? Can we get more volume? Um, oh, you know, the speaker.
He still needs more volume now. You think it might be all the way up?
Okay, if you would, uh, please open up to John chapter 4. Father, we do pray that you would breathe life upon these words, God, that you would anoint my words, anoint the ears, may the hearts be good soil. Lord, that we would be about your business, God, of uh, winning souls, Lord, for your glory. Thank you, Lord. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 7, it says, There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. In my small opinion, Jesus gave one of the most important keys in evangelism right there by asking her for a drink of water. Do you know what it was? He was intentional. It wasn't about the drink of water. It was about talking to her. Being intentional is just about everything in evangelism. So if we pray for this passion for lost people and we see people... Will be intentional. So we look for icebreakers. Like if I saw you, I'd say, Wow, your your bracelet's real pretty. Bam. And you want to start with a compliment. You don't want to this icebreaker to be a negative, okay? But so purpose in your heart to speak to people. Purpose in your heart to speak to people. Be intentional. So Jesus says to her, We give me a drink. His disciples have gone into the city to buy food. I want to just kind of hop and skip around here. Verse 9. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it you being a Jew asked me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan? Because Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus says to her in 10, verse 10, If you knew the gift of God, who it is it says to you give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw. And the well was deep. You know, how do you expect to get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself, his sons and his cattle. Jesus answered her and said, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. He's talking about natural H2O. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst but the water that I give him will become in him a water, a well of water spring up to eternal life. So he's talking all about this water, right? You're never going to get thirsty again. You're going to have this spring up into eternal life. And she says, Lord, or she says, give me this water. She wants it. But he doesn't give it to her, does he? He wants to go deeper. He wants to deal with some issues and he wants to give credibility to who he is. So she says, give me the water. He says to her, go call your husband and come here. Jesus controlled the conversation. Another key in evangelism. He set her up. He knew where he wanted to go. If I saw her with her bracelet, 
I'm already three, four sentences beyond that before I even spoke a single word to her. I know where I want to go with this. When my wife and I are at the dinner, she already knows. Like one time many years ago, we're sitting here getting ready to have dinner, and this, and we're on this lower tier, and there's this upper tier of tables. And this couple came, and I just felt this, this thing that we're supposed to uh, witness to them. But of course, I feel like that about everybody. And uh, I said, uh, honey, uh, I said, you know, why don't we say grace? And she said, uh, we just, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, let's, um, let's say grace. So I gave this Billy Graham type of prayer. You know what I mean? Like A game, took it right to the edge. <laughs> And the guy up above says, wow, he says, you can pray for our food. And I said, I'd rather pray for you. I said, I just want you to know with what you're going through right now, these deep waters, that Jesus is the answer. And he just started to well up immediately. And, and you know what? The more you step out, the more God steps in. The more you step out of the boat, the more God steps in. And the Lord just said to me, you make sure you tell them that, Craig. Because that's how it's in my entire life. The more you step out, the more he steps in. That, please. Uh, in that little process, I'm there, and I'm but you're receiving a word of knowledge, and that's why you said, let's pray. Did you get a word of knowledge? Oh, I don't know. I'm not that smart. It's not smart. No, I know. I'm, you know what? Possibly. Not you know, saying because yeah. you went there. Okay. Yeah. You know, I just, I just felt this thing, you know. Um, you know, I just felt that there was this need. This guy had this need. And, and then when we started talking, he said, you can pray for my food. And God just gave me a word. That, no. Pray for you, okay? And um, I describe it like, it's kind of hard, the discernment. I refer to it as sniffing. I can smell it. I just pray for Walter. He's going to Turkey to spy out the land. And, and I said, you... Nestorenko. And I said, you know what? You better take your Flonies. So you can, you know, I'm teasing him. But I prayed. Here, let me give you, this is kind of like off the, the cuff, but let me tell you where this is at. I, I share with you my first experience with the supernatural. I'm nine years old. And demons are in, under my bed at my aunt and uncle's house. I'm flying through the air. All right? Um, probably in the early 90s, we had this couples want to get married in our church she was from England and there was people coming from around the world so this guy Kenneth was going to stay at our home we were opening up our home to him and uh, all we knew was he would show up about 3 o'clock in the morning so we have three little kids we're all in bed ding dong sure enough 3 o'clock in the morning my wife and I go down and we open the door and here's like this Arnold Schwarzenegger type guy you know and uh, he goes, hey, I'm Ken. I say, hey, Ken, I'm Craig. It's my wife, Kathy. Come on in. And he walked by me. Every hair on my body just stood on end. And I, sm I just, this is how I describe it. I just smelled a spirit of murder all over this guy. And my, I just cringed. And so I was actually not, a, we weren't a very good host at the time. He should have taken one of the kids' rooms and they should have slept downstairs. But he slept downstairs on a hide-us bed sofa type gig. So I went upstairs. I told my wife what the deal was and we prayed protection. The next day the wedding came and, and he, it was just this anger. Even when he danced, he seemed like ticked off, you know. So sun, Saturday, Sunday comes and I forget about the whole thing. But that's because the Lord wanted to bless me. Okay? God always wants to take us deeper and deeper. And again, the more we step out, the more he steps in. 
You know, he wants us to be risk takers for him. He wants us to trust him. So, so Monday morning, he's sitting at one end of the day, and I forgot about this whole thing about spirit of murder. That's because God wanted it like that. He's sitting at the end of the table, I'm sitting at the other end of the kitchen table, and I'm thinking, he's about 20. I just want to pray for this guy. Just pray for him. So he says, hey, Craig, I was wondering if you would pray for me. And I said, you know, I'd really like to pray for you. And so I go over to him, and uh, I said, well, can I pray for you then? That's him and I in this house, Arnold and myself. Okay? <laughs> and he says, well, you know, I'm lonely. I'd love to be married. And I'm like, okay, cool. Anything else? He goes, nope, that's it. I said, fine. So I lay my hand on shoulder. And I prayed a couple words, and the Lord very softly said, that's not it. And I just stopped, and I said, um, Ken, are you sure there's nothing else? He said, nope. And I'm like thinking, you know, you're real jigot. You know what I mean? I'm just, he got a hole in his head, not hearing his feel. So, so I start praying again. Just fire, and I start praying for his wife. But a couple words come out. And again, the Lord says, that's not it. So I stopped, and he said, are you sure there's nothing else? He goes, no. And I'm like, you know. So I laid my hand on the shoulder and I said, and I don't even get a word out. And the Lord has like this bow surround sound system with a subwoofer on my head. And he just blasted it through me. And he says, that's not it. And so, even before I get a word out, I just stop and say, that's not it, Ken. There's something else. Now I'm direct and I'm telling him. And he said to me, well, there is one thing. And I said, what? And this is what he did. He went, and he looked away. I thought, oh my gosh. This is huge. Because he broke the eye contact. And I thought, oh my gosh. I said, what is it? He said, and again, Arnold's here. I'm the old guy here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he says, at times, I feel like strangling people. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, rewind back when he came in the house. And I remembered it. And I said, have you felt that lately? Oh, this is verbatim. And he says, yes, right now. That's what he said to me. And you know what? At the time, God will meet you right where you're at. Not an ounce of fear. Okay? Not an ounce of... Somehow there was a puddle on the floor. But no, I'm kidding. But no, I'm serious. There was not an ounce of fear. He said, yes, right now. And I said to him with authority, I said, I would expect it. Because we uncovered something here. And we're going to deal with it right now. So I laid my hands on him before he laid them on me. And, uh, you know, I, I prayed over him and gave him a book, Weapons of Our Warfare. And I got him out of Dodge quick. But, uh, but, that, that just, and it was like the guy at the table. I just felt something. One time I was in a church down in uh, Florida. A uh, big church. And, uh, so the usher, the greeter guy takes me in the back room and there's a pastor with like nine, ten elders. And they say, here, Craig, have a seat. And the pastor says, hey, Craig Fazer, Christian Equippers. Craig's not going to be with us a few days, blah, blah, blah. And uh, brothers, we want to pray for him right now. And he said to me, he said, do you mind if I lay my hand on your shoulder? And I thought, what a peculiar thing to ask me. We're brothers. Now maybe I only thought that because God had me think it. But when he touched me, a spirit of homosexuality shot right in from him. And sure enough, as the days went on, he wanted prayer for his marriage. And so we need to understand that when we step out of the boat, expect the Holy Spirit to show up. And you listen to that. You listen to that. Okay? And the more you do that, the more familiar you'll be with, with what he's saying to you. Okay? So, so Jesus says, you know, go call your husband. 
And uh, the woman says, you know, uh, I have no husband. And she said, yeah, you're right. You've had five. And the jerk who you with now, he's not your husband either. You know, and she says, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I see you're a prophet. So, again, the gifts are coming out now. And he goes on and on and on and on. And um, <clears throat> verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him are spirit worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming called the Christ, and when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, imagine, imagine when Jesus looks at you, he looks through you. How do we even stand in his presence? I mean, it'll be like phenomenal. He said, I who speak to you am he. At that point, the disciples come. They're amazed that he was speaking with her. And uh, they go on and on. The woman leaves the water pot, goes into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things I've done. Is this not the Christ? And it goes on to say, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat. Okay, and he says, I have food to eat you know nothing about. Disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat today. Jesus said, my food is to do his will. And they go on and on. She comes out from the city. Many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I've ever done. So check this out. The disciples are in the, the town. They're stopping at the Burger King or whatever, right? They come back. They got the fries, the chocolate, you know, the whole deal. They say, hey, Lord, you want something to eat? She goes back into the same town, crosses the same paths with the same people. And how many times we walk by people who are open. And when we start doing this, you're going to be walking in the towns that Christians have walked by these people a thousand times. But because we're purposing in our heart, because God's going to start leading us by His Holy Spirit, you're going to pick up on things because there are just a world of hurting people out there. And she becomes the evangelist. And many of those people that she probably witnessed to had mocked her, called her names, but what did she do? She walked in love and forgiveness at all times. And we must always walk in love and forgiveness, realizing, just like Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them, they know what, not what they do. They're blinded. My goodness, you want to see the reality of that scripture? Look at the world we live in today. There's such a harvest out there. She literally becomes the evangelist. She's not even one of the guys that is hanging out with Jesus. Yet she becomes the evangelist. And these guys, what are they thinking? Just cardinal stuff, getting their food. Okay? So, let's talk about some things here while we have time. Um, I want to talk about fear and rejection. A lot of Christians say that they do not share their faith because of fear and rejection. First of all, you cannot be rejected. Okay? Because it's not about you. It's about Him. They, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Him. Okay? All we are is the UPS delivery guy. That's all we are. UPS comes to your door, right? Knock on the door. Oh, it's a penny. I've got a penny for you. Yeah, I'm not interested. Okay. Yeah, he just moves on to somebody who else is. He doesn't feel rejected. He doesn't start breaking down and saying, <laughs> No, he just moves along. <clears throat> the average American needs to hear the gospel nine times before they get saved. Nine times. What if you, for the rest of your life, never lead anybody to Christ, but you're always, and you don't know this, but you're always number eight? 
And this other guy who's led tons of people to Christ, he's number nine. But without you, he couldn't have done it because their hearts won't be ready yet. We can't, we can't be results uh, oriented here. That is flesh. We're not looking for results. We're looking just to be obedient to the Lord. Some water, some plant, some water, and the Lord brings the harvest. That's it. You know, I just plant all the time. Man, I'm just scattering seed wherever I go. That's all. No big deal. I'm on the phone the other day. I got this new line. I'm always coming up with lines. Paul said, you know, we talked about Jesus. He set her up. Hey, um, <clears throat> got a drink of water? Right? And they, they get up to talk to her. Hey, I like the bracelet. Just whatever. 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 You know? One time, this older man is in an older Cadillac. And the car is just impeccable. They would say it's in cherry condition. So I went by him and I went. <whistles> and he looks up. I said, boy. And I could care less about that hunk of metal. I said, boy, look at that car. She is a beauty. <laughs> I had her since she'd been brand new. I changed the oil every 2,500 miles. Quaker State 10W40. <laughs> She's a beauty, I'll tell you that. <sighs> yep, she's a good girl. I said, let me ask you something. I said, you know, I said, this price sounds dumb. But, now, I, now he goes, go ahead, go ahead and ask me. I said, nah, it sounds kind of dumb. But if you insist, <laughs> do, you think, uh, do you think there's going to be like Cadillacs in heaven? He goes, oh, I don't know about Cadillacs in heaven, but I'll tell you what, man, she gives a smooth ride. Those white walls, I polish them every couple of weeks. And, and so, so he's going on the car, and I pull it back. See, I know where I'm going with this conversation. It's already taken care of. Because I'm purposing in my heart. I'm being intentional because he's going to die one day. <clears throat> and what if Jesus is telling the truth? See, that's the stuff that just... Uh, for 35 years. I said, yeah, I said, I guess you're right. Yeah, I don't know if there's going to be Calax in heaven at all. I said, how about you? I said, you plan on going to heaven? I don't know. You know, I haven't really thought much about it. I said, wow. I said, uh, is your next heartbeat guaranteed? I mean, oh, well, I, guess, I guess not. But see, when you start with a compliment, see, if I'd gone up and thought I'd guy about God, he'd probably curse me out or something. I said, you know what? I just happen to have a little pamphlet here called, Are You Going to Heaven? And I said, I would love to see you there one day. I said, I got to go, but will you promise me you'll read this? He goes, young man, he says, I'll definitely read it. And I said, okay, thank you so much. You know, but just being intentional. Everybody we come in contact with. When I look at people like tonight, all I see is a bunch of beating hearts with blood running through your veins. And they're going to stop one day. And what if he's telling the truth? That's the problem here. What if he's telling the truth? Well, of course he's telling the truth. Well, then I need to live like he's telling the truth. So I got this new line. I'm on the phone the other day with like a, a Verizon type thing, you know, and I'm calling about my bill or whatever. And I'm talking to Lori. And uh, uh, she said, was I a help? I said, Lori, you were wonderful. Thank you so much. She said, uh, uh, all right, well, uh, thank you again for being a Verizon customer. I said, hey, Lori, I said, do you just have a few more seconds? I said, and you know what, God, this is something new with the Lord and me, okay? This is what I said to her. I said, I feel responsible to, to tell you something. 
I said, you know what? I'm a 66-year-old guy. I said, I've walked around the block, say like 66 times. And I said, Lori, I just got to tell you, if I have found one truth in all these years, it's simply this, that Jesus loves you. He, that he really did die for your sins. He really did rise from the dead. And, and he is not some fairy tale, but it's the real deal. And I said, you know, I don't know where you're at with all that stuff, but, you know, back in 1981, I was almost divorced, and this man shared with what I'm sharing with you. And people, you know, people get quiet. People start crying. You know, I want to pray. I said, you know, can we just take another few minutes? Can I just pray for you for a second? You wait for God to show up again in that whole thing. And, but I said, I, I just felt responsible, Lori. That's the only truth I've found in my entire life. And, and, and she's like, wow. She said, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. The more you step out, the more he steps in. One time at Olive Garden, and um, there's this painting. Actually, it was a, a, a picture. And it had, you know what? It, it had like tables like this. And then it had tables down here. And it had rows of people on both sides. And they were all, all the ladies were dressed so eloquently. And the men had these big puffy shirts with these big flowery type ties and these big cigars and brandy sniffers and exactly just like you're doing right there exactly that's it I think you were the third table over with that blonde hair guy Daniel Craig James Bond that guy and and so anyway but this picture is over a hundred years old do you want to refill on that by the way and uh, so it's, it's over a hundred years old and uh, so I'm just there looking at it, and this young hostess comes over, this young kid. Of course, everybody's a kid now. I, a buddy of mine, we were talking about that on Saturday. Everybody's a kid, you know. And uh, so this young girl comes over. She's like 18, 19-year-old girl, you know. And, I, and she said, sir, can I help you? And I said, you know, and I'm looking at her like, you know, like I'm really into this, you know. And I'm like, I said, you know, I'm just looking at this uh, photograph here. And you get the right stance. You know? Paul said, I become all things to all men. See, he's setting people up all the time. Jesus setting people up all the time. And I said, you know, and, I, and we, we gave that same descriptive thing. And I said, you know, what do you, what do you, th what do you think they all have in common? And she, she said, you know, sir, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, I know. She said, they're all dead. And I said, you're right. And I said, I wonder how many of them got to heaven. And she's looking. She said, I don't know. I said, look, like they don't have a care in the world. But now, like all their investments and all, you know, it really didn't even matter. Look. Do you plan on going to heaven? And she says, you know, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. I said, well, is your next heartbeat guaranteed? She said, no. And she's looking at me and I'm looking at her and I said, listen. Um, you know what? You'll probably never see me again. And, and now my eyes are welling up with tears. I mean, God's just and downloaded. I said, and I looked at her and I just loved on her like a father to a daughter. And I said, you know what? This will show you how to get to heaven. And I said, I just give this to you because I care about you. That's it. And she could see the tears in my eyes. And, and she looked at me and she said, sir, Thank you so very much. And, uh, and, and I went out in the car and my pastor friend was out there. And I just started to, to weep really deep. 
And I said, you know, Bob, I said, what else do we have to do except share the gospel? Because what if he's telling the truth? And eternity's a long time. And he is telling the truth. I'm going through Milwaukee's uh, airport. I think that's where I was. And I see this older man standing there. He's like, kind of helps everybody. And I say, yeah, I'm looking for Southwest. I mean, uh, Southwest. And uh, that was a joke. Get it? Southwest. West. U.S. Scare. Air. Never mind. So anyway, I said, yeah, I'm looking for, you know, I'm looking for the Concord for Southwest. You know where it's at? Yeah, yeah, right down there. He says, um, I said, okay, thank you so much. God bless you. He says, you got your boarding pass? Uh, I do, I said. I said, do you have yours? <laughs> Immediate. Because it's not what I do, it's who I am. And if you start doing this, it's automatic. Like my buddy has six black belts. One day I grabbed his wrist. He put me in a hold and threw me like in one second. He's like, yo, Faz, I'm sorry. I just, you know, it's like I didn't even think about it. It's automatic. And that's how this is. He says, you got your boarding pass? I said, I do. Do you? He says, I'm not going anywhere. I said, sure you are. Are your bags packed? And he's looking at me now like I'm from Mars. I said, man, you're getting ready for a trip. Just like everybody in here. But not the trip they think they're taking. I said, we're all planning on a trip to enter eternity. You got your boarding pass? You going to heaven? So if, if you stood before the Lord God Almighty, he said, and I looked at his name tag, you know, Ralph, why should I let you into my kingdom? What would you say? And he's like, you know, this guy's just been hit by like four jabs. He never saw any of them coming. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's because he's probably going to enter eternally one day. And, you know, we've got to deal with that. All right? Fear, rejection, they're all based on pride, the original sin. Okay? Let me give you what fear stands for in an acrostic pattern. False evidence appearing real. Don't listen to it. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but a love, a power, sound mind, or self-discipline. Okay? Loving one. These tracks are phenomenal. You know what? I, I don't know if I have enough for everybody, but everybody can take one and just pass them around if you want one. That's through our ministry. Uh, two question test, are you going to heaven? It's like the bottom line, they're really awesome. But just loving on people, loving on next door neighbors, you know? Like your next door, anybody here have a next door neighbor? Yes. Where are you at, brother? North of the Arctic Circle? Or? No, I'm teasing you. <laughs> All right. Did you ever see that show on Netflix, North of the Arctic Circle? It's like 300 miles away from anybody. Well, you know what? Go home and bake your next door neighbor some blueberry muffins. And when, and when they, and you know, let's say you're, what's your first name? Trisha. I do that. No, I don't. Okay. okay, but let's say you're Trisha and your next door neighbor is Mark. So you go over, you ring her, you're like, ding dong. And you've always had this long distance. Hey, girl. Hey, girl, how you doing? But you never even come over on the properties. That's how it is today. Like when I grew up, we walked in each other's houses. So just, you know. And uh, so anyway, so you go over to Mark. And just say, hey, what's he doing? Hey, listen, I baked these for you. And she said, well, what'd you do that for? Oh, I was just thinking of you. And then she says, hey, you know what? I gotta go. I'll catch you later. She says, okay, thanks a lot. And she shuts the door. It's not about the blueberry muffins. You guys, you got a friend that likes to go bass fishing or something. And it's the same old thing. Hey, what up, bro? Hey, how you doing? You know, same old thing. No intimacy, no relationship, no nothing. So one day you stop at Dick's Sporting Goods so you're picking up a bass lure for $5. And you see him pulling in. Yo, Jimmy, you got one minute? Yeah, yeah, hold on. So you take it over to him and say, hey, he said, listen, I know you like to go bass fishing. I picked up this bass lure. 
I hear you really catch the big ones with it. And he's like, well, what would you do that for? I was just thinking about you. Hey, I got to go. Marge has dinner ready. I got to roll, bro. Okay, have a great day. He shuts the door. It's not about the Lord. It's about he cares about me. See, nobody thinks anybody cares about him. And then when there's a men's breakfast, now I have credibility with him, all because of a $5 bass lure. And he's hooked. Get it? Hooked? <laughs> hey? Or ladies, if you're going grocery shopping, where do we go grocery shopping around here? Give it up for shop right in the house. Ho! Okay, so you get the tide two for one. Again, knock on your neighbor's door. If God, you pray to God and say, Lord, who is in need of your love? And see who he gives you. And you start building a relationship with that person. You just start loving on them. You knock on the door. Ding dong. Okay, Marge answers the door. And she's shocked to see you because you guys barely talk. And she answers the door. She goes, oh, Oh, hi, Ian. How are you? Uh, I'm good, March. How are you? Listen, I was at ShopRite. They had tied two for one. She's like, get out of here, girl. No. And she said, she, they had two for one. And uh, listen, I picked one up for you. Oh, what'd you do that for? Just thinking about you. Hey, I got to go. I'll see you. Have a great day. She's heading back to the kitchen laundry room. It's not about the tide. She was thinking about her. And now you're on your way to building relationship. And let's say the ladies are getting together at the church. I don't know what ladies do. Let's say uh, going raccoon hunting or uh, 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 having tea. Okay? And whatever. Well, now you have the credibility to go and ask her. That's it. And it, this is so easy. This girl, Colleen, came up to me at a meeting one night. Can we go to 9 o'clock? Colleen comes up to me one night and she says, Craig, I got to tell you, I got a raise at work. And this woman, Eleanor, hates me because the boss overlooked her. Colleen's like in her 20s. And this Eileen is like 45 and they overlooked her. And now Eileen hates her. She says, what should I do? I said, go buy her some hand cream. She said, what? I said, go buy her some hand cream. She's like, but Craig, I said, go, go to the dollars. No, I didn't tell her that. But I said, go get her some hand cream, put a nice little boxy with a little ribbony, okay, and just give it to her. And I said, you know the whole schmeal, how you do it. So I'm back in that church a few months later, and Colleen comes up to me, nice kid. But they're all kids, you know what I mean? And so she comes up and she says, Craig, I gotta tell you what happened. And I and I said, Oh, I said, Oh my gosh, that, that woman Eileen hated you, right? I gotta tell you what happened. I came in Monday morning, I, I had this hand cream and I had it wrapped in this beautiful paper, a little bow, just like you said. And I wa I walked up to Eileen and uh, I said, uh, morning Eileen. Mor Eileen said, morning. <laughs> Woo! You know, and, and so she was Morning. And she just walked away. And she sat at her desk. She said like two minutes later, ring, 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 ring. Hello? Uh, hi, Colleen. Whole different person. <laughs> she said, thank you so much for that hand cream. That was so nice of you. She said, why did you do that? Because I was thinking about you. Now they're close. They pray together. And then she gets to share a testimony with her. She gets to invite her to church, praise for her. It's not rocket science. It's just having a passion for lost people. You know, um, you know, the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. I'm getting my gas pumped one day. This guy's totally dressed in green. He's got a green cell phone. He's got green shoes, pants, shirt. 
and he's pumping my gas, and I said, and I'm standing next to him. In Jersey, you know, we're not smart enough to pump our own gas. You know, so he's pumping our gas. He says, um, what color do you think is my favorite color? <laughs> and I'm like, um, oh, I don't know, I'm not really good at games, you know, guessing games like this, you know. He goes, well, it's green. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, really? I would have never, I never would have won with green. I never would have went with green. Ding, ding, ding. Gosh. It's really fun. You know, it really is. Like, one minute I'm home crying my eyes out over lost people. Then the next minute, like, you're laughing your rear end off. He goes, uh, he goes, uh, and he's pumping again. He goes, yeah, my favorite color is green. I said, no, really? He goes, yeah. I said, wow. He says, uh, he says uh, and I like green money. And uh, I said, okay. And I said, uh, now see, it's like autopilot. I said, what color do you think is my favorite color? I said, what color do you think is my favorite? See, I'm taking control of this conversation. Because there's a good chance he's going to die one day. And I'm convinced Jesus is telling the truth. Amen. And eternity is a long time. See, these things keep going through my head. I'm like a prisoner of the Lord, and that's how I want it. Thank you, Lord. And uh, so I said, what color do you think is my favorite color? He goes, um, because uh, I have blue jeans on. You know, he says, blue? I said, nope. I said, red. I said, do you know what shade of red? Uh... Uh, no. I said crimson red. He goes, really? He said, how come? I said, that, I said, because when Jesus died on the cross for my sins, his blood was shed for me. And I said, you know, brother, I said, you can have all the money in the world, but as soon as you die your last heartbeat, the only color that matters is that you're washed in that crimson red blood of his. And just... It's just autopilot. The more you do it, the more natural it becomes. I'm just telling you. Um, one time I'm outside of Whole Foods, and uh, there's a guy out there selling love beads. He was like a thawed-out hippie from the 60s. And, no, literally, you know, he had like the long hair and, and love beads. And I, and I said, dude, where do you, where do you live, man? He says, I live in the woods over there. He says, I'm taking a train to Colorado tomorrow. I said, no kidding. And uh, uh, wow, I said, uh, so where are you at with, with God and all that stuff? You know? And that's how I say it sometimes. It's, it's kind of who I'm talking to, how I act, what I say. You know, I say, you know, God and all that stuff. You know, where are you at with that stuff? You know, and I started to hear some truth, but then sprinkled in with New Age lies. So instead of shoving the gospel down his throat, I said, um, hey, can I buy you dinner? It was like 5 o'clock. He goes, if you want to. He says, I haven't eaten all day. I said, well, let, let's go in. Let's go into Whole Foods. And I said, we'll go to the hop bar. You get whatever you want. And I walked in. And the Holy Spirit says, get him groceries for tomorrow on his trip to Colorado. I says, you know what? I said, why don't we eat some groceries for your trip tomorrow? And uh, I, had, I had Pastor Josh's visa card. It all worked out great. You know, it was, thank you again. And uh, so anyway, he's, uh, and I'll tell you what, this God's honest truth. He picked up some apples and he looked at me most with the pleading eyes and he said, could I have some apples? And it broke my heart. He may think he was asking for a Lexus or something. And this kid's been living out in the woods. And I said, please, I could say, take whatever you want. Get whatever you want. So we got like four bags of groceries. Then he started to get his meal. And it became like Mount Rushmore. You know what I mean? And you got to get the lid on it. So we had to get a crank to get the lid down. And I said, uh, I said, well, you're not done yet, are you? He goes, yeah. I said, well, where's your dessert? I mean, you had to have dessert. And he smiled at me. So I got him dessert. 
And so we had four bags of groceries. I got two in each hand. He's got this big platter of food. We're outside. It was in September. I'll never forget it. And we're outside, and I just let him eat. Jesus always met the physical and the emotional needs before the spiritual. So you see a guy laying in the gutter, okay? You don't get down there and say, Hey, you know what, buddy? You need to repent because you're going to hell. <laughs> no, you need to give that guy a cup of coffee and a sandwich and love on him. Really? Jesus was always moved with compassion. He always had mercy. And after he ate, I said to him, do you mind if I just pray for you a minute? And I'll tell you what, the presence of the Lord just fell. And this kid, 21 years old, I got my hand on his chest and I'm praying for him. His tears are falling off his cheek onto my hand. You ever had that happen, guys? I'll tell you, that's really a moment when you're praying for, for a guy and his tears are just falling on your hands. And uh, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, uh, I got baptized when I was six years old. And he said, then I started going on the wrong path. And he said, I've needed somebody to have this conversation with me for a long time. And I said, well, listen, here's my phone number. I said, you call me anytime. And this is what I said, and I listened to the words. I am committed to your success. You have my number. I'm not calling you. But I'm here for you. You need me 3 o'clock in the morning. I am here for you. I'm honored to be linked with you, to help you in any way that I can. God loves you, brother. And I'll tell you what. He gave me a hug. And when I walked away... It was like I just finished a Jenny Craig diet and dropped 30 pounds. I mean, I didn't even feel the, the asphalt on the parking lot. And there's nothing that compares with that stuff. Nothing. And the last story I'll tell you, we're supposed to end at 8.30, right? Okay, if I can just, can I have one more story? I had so much here in so little time. Um, in 2009, I started to get into the healing side of the gospel. I met Todd White. Anybody know his name? Unbelievable, right? Prayed for 500 people, never saw anybody get healed. Do you know that? And then finally somebody got healed. What if he stopped praying at 499 and said, ah, this just doesn't work? You know? He, laid, he prayed impartation prayer over me. I didn't sense a blessed thing. But I started praying for people, and all of a sudden, I'm seeing people get healed. And, and um, I was actually doing a meeting out in uh, Carson City in Nevada. And the Lord told me, when I got into the healing side of the gospel, He said, I want you, you personally, when you're in a church, I want you to have nothing to do with it. I don't want any eyes on you. So in other words, I always get other people to pray, you know, and it's so awesome. And uh, so the days of the evangelist with a sparkly jacket like Liberace, you playing the piano. I mean, that, that is just, I mean, God wants to raise up an army. He wants to multiply in himself and, you know, so we're in Carson City one night and I, I spoke on identity for an hour and I, because you got to get your identity right. You walk in a, a, a son or a daughter consciousness and not a sin consciousness and knowing who you are in Him. And, and I said, all right, you know what? Who would like to pray for some people here tonight? Four little girls came forward. And I said, this is so cool. I said, uh, uh, does Jesus live in your heart? And they go, yep. I said, and your prayers are as good as mine. I said, let's go. And so we went over to the first guy. I said, what's going on? And we talked about rotator cuff. Well, he had a torn rotator cuff. I said, okay, guy, put your hand on his shoulder. He sees little innocent hands, his little skinny arms and all there. And I said, Father, in the name of Jesus. And they're like, Father, in the name of Jesus. 
we speak to this rotator cuff, we command it be, to be uh, sewn back together. And, and sometimes they would get lost and they'd say, uh, yeah, put it back together. And uh, so they're kind of ad-libbing everything. And, and I, said, I said, Lord, thank you for healing him in Jesus' name. And they're Jesus' name. And, I, and, and I'd say, go ahead, tell him to try it out. And they're like, try it out. And the guy's like swinging his arm, you know. And we saw, and if I'm not telling the truth, may God strike, uh, what's your name, brother? <laughs> no, I'm teasing. No, but, but honestly, if I'm not telling the truth, may God strike me dead right now, where you could see a manifestation. Like if the guy had a high blood pressure, it's not like we had a, you know, we could check it. But where you could see a manifestation, we saw minimum 95% that night. And it was all these little girls praying. And, and they're like this to their parents. They're like, oh, Mommy, did you see how Jesus used me tonight? And so I get on that bird to come home. Got my Diet Coke, my pretzels. And I'm thinking, man, Lord, that was awesome. Because now I leave an army out there doing their deal. And they're now waiting for me to come back next year. You know? So, uh, so what I wanted to tell you is, and this is the last story. I'm in Pomeroy's. It was uh, December 23rd. I was getting a jump start on Christmas shopping. And uh, no, not Pomeroy's, it's Bamberger's or whatever it was called, Morristown Mall. And I see this woman in a wheelchair, like 35 years old. And it looked like her mother was pushing her. She was about 60. And I went over and I said, uh, I said, hey, you know, how you doing? And she says, okay. And I said, uh, you know what? Um, I was just moved by compassion to come over here and, and, and you know and see what's going on. And she said, "I have uh, MS." And I'd heard of that multiple sclerosis. I didn't have any idea what it was, to be honest with you. And I said, "Well, listen, can I pray for you?" And uh, she said, "Sure." And uh, so I, she said, "Let's get out of the aisle." And so I went over to the side. And I knew I had to deal with the muscles and she couldn't walk and stuff. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just getting down the floor, you know, I say, okay to touch her legs. She says, yeah. And so I'm just, whatever comes to mind, you know, I speak to these muscles. I command them to be strengthened in the name of Jesus. And I remember thinking one time, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Probably Todd would say that. That's what I'm thinking. Probably Todd would say that. So this is like 2010. I'm just kind of really getting into this. And, but I didn't know what I was doing, kind of like now. And uh, so, uh, now that's the fun of it. You just, you know, just kind of go for it because what if he's telling the truth? You know, see, it always gets that whole thing. So uh, I said, you want to try it out? And she goes, yeah. Well, I don't realize it. She's got a Velcro belt, like eight inches. And she goes, this is holding her up in the chair. She came and sit up in a chair. So I get behind her and help her up. Kind of like Acts chapter 3. They helped the lame beggar to his feet. And as they did, see the lame beggar wasn't healed yet. But as they did, his feet and ankles were strengthened. So I lift her up and I'm like behind her. Just got, got her there in case she starts falling. And she starts walking. And in like a chair, sure, she's at the door. And I always ask people, you know, like, what's going on? You know, like, you know, what you feel, what you sense. Sometimes people don't feel anything. And I sit there, let me the door now. And I think, oh, we're going to start from the chair. And I said, what's going on? And she says, I'm walking. She said, I haven't walked like this in nine years. And so, you know, just, just do it. Because he who lives in us is the answer to everything that's out there. And so she sat back down, she's crying, I'm prophesying over her. I go outside, tears are running down my cheeks. It's cold, it's dark, it's windy. I feel the coldness of my cheeks. And I said, Lord, thank you so much. I mean, I never expected to ever see anything like this. And he said to me, thank you. And I knew exactly what he meant. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for being a risk taker. 
So I'll leave you with that. Because I think, I think we're full. We could keep eating. We've got a lot to chew on, but it's late. I went over time. Thank you for your graciousness to allow me to do so. So, Father, I just seal up everything you've done tonight, Lord. Not only in their hearts, but my heart, Lord. Totally consume us, Lord. Don't give us a choice in the matter, Lord. That our goal, Lord, would be your trophies to bring you glory and honor. And Lord, right now, I pray for each person here. And I pray, Lord, right now that you give them the names and faces of people that need your love. Thank you, Papa. Father, I leave your blessing upon this house, upon everyone here, Lord, for their families, their loved ones, Lord. Pray God for divine protection, healing, restoration, and more than anything, God, salvation. Lord, we know you're telling the truth, God. And eternity is a long time. Thank you, Papa, that we be googly-eyed in love with you, Lord, and love you the way you deserve to be loved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.